Please remain standing for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured. And the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. It's not the only response uh, I ever get when people find out that I'm a clergyman. Sometimes the response is simply, really? Uh, Sometimes, gratifyingly, still well into my fifth decade, it's, ooh, you're very young. But quite often, what people say is, yes, well, I'm not really a Christian myself, but I do love Jesus' teaching, especially the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, For me, that really sums it all up. I don't think we need to be religious, but I can really, I can really get on board with the Sermon on the Mount. It's almost as though the Sermon on the Mount, as it's recorded in Matthew, and the Sermon on the Plain, as it's recorded in Luke, possibly the same event, possibly different events. You'll see Jesus and his disciples come down the mountain and find a level, find a level place. It's not the normal name for, for, for a plain at, at sea level. It may just be a, a sort of flat spot on the mountain where there's space for people to gather around. Uh, and Jesus begins to preach. And this Sermon on the Plain that includes Beatitudes, that is sayings of, you are blessed, just as Matthew does, It's almost like this is the acceptable face of Jesus. Uh, And not just to us, but in his own generation. Um, You see the description of the people who gathered to hear him. There's a large crowd of his disciples, the people who've been following him around. Uh, But there they are in Galilee, right in the middle of uh, ancient Israel. Uh, And um, the crowd is enormously cosmopolitan. It includes people from way down in the south in Judah and Jerusalem and way up north, in fact, so far north that they're outside the boundaries of what was ever considered to be Israel in Tyre and Sidon, Phoenicia. And they've come south and they've come north to gather and hear Jesus. These are serious journeys to make in a time before the development of paved roads and motor cars. And so you can sense the sort of expectancy People pushing in, trying to touch Jesus to to, to receive healing, spiritually and physically. But also they want to hear him. Jesus, the great teacher, is about to speak. And I wonder if you've ever sort of thought about Jesus in these terms, that really, at his heart, what he is for us is a great teacher. Frequently, I think, that understanding of Jesus comes about because we've not really grappled hard enough 
with what his teaching actually is. Because the teaching that we just read in Luke chapter 6 is about the most earth-shattering thing that Jesus ever said. It completely overturns the values of his generation and ours. It completely subverts a way of seeing the world. It invites you in to the biggest revolution that there has ever been or ever will be. It's utterly radical. We've got so used to it that we sometimes miss its force. Yes, blessed are the poor. But listen again to what Jesus says. In fact, we get two sets of four statements, four blessings and four woes, and they mirror each other perfectly. So what you've really got is four pairs. Let me just read them to you as pairs. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God, but woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. Speaking to his disciples, Jesus says, you are better off poor, hungry, miserable and unpopular than the richest, most satisfied, happiest, most popular and well thought of people in the world. Now tell me that doesn't feel at least a bit uncomfortable. That Jesus seems to be inviting his disciples to a life of hunger, poverty, misery and disgrace. And yet he says, blessed are you. Blessed. That doesn't feel right, does it? Hard to say a hearty amen to that. Hard to read those verses and to imagine right now, leaving church this morning, walking a foot above the ground with delight at what a privilege it is to be a Christian. When what Jesus is saying is, Poverty, misery, hunger, rejection. And yet, how about you think about it this way? What if it is that Jesus stands in front of all these people and says, listen, you're going to have to make the most difficult decision you've ever made when it comes to whether you really want to follow me. But... If you choose my way, it is more blessed than you could possibly ever have imagined. This is a life so wonderful that it is beyond your comprehension. You would never aim for what I'm offering you in your life because it just seems impossible. But I'm offering you a life better than the life you always wanted. I'm offering you an existence more wonderful than you ever dreamed. What if that's what Jesus is doing? Because I think he is doing that. So that he can say, blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry. Even poor and hungry and rejected by society and weeping. You are living, if you are living with Jesus, a more blessed life than the happiest, most satisfied plutocrat that ever lived. I mean, imagine the four things he's describing almost never come together, do they? Incredible wealth, complete satisfaction, total joy, and everyone speaking well of you. He's picking the, the, the sort of, you know how they sometimes say, well, look, you can have it uh, cheap, fast, and good, 
Well, th those are the three options, and you can have two out of the three. How many people do you know of? It's very unlikely that you know any of them in person, but how many people do you know of who have achieved all their wealth goals, now feel satisfied with what they have, are blissfully happy, and everyone thinks they're great? I can't think of anyone. And yet what Jesus says is to have all of those things, but not me, is utterly to be miserable, to, to have woe pronounced upon you, to be in a terrible place. Because even to be poor and hungry and unpopular and miserable with me is supremely blessed by comparison. Those are big claims, aren't they? And Jesus says, if you follow me, you might be poor. And you might be hungry. And you well might weep. And you will be, at least some of the time, despised. Speaking to his disciples, most of them would not live to the end of their natural lives. They were put to death for their allegiance to Jesus. So how are we supposed to make sense of what Jesus is saying? Well, partly he invites us to take a longer term view than we normally do of our lives. And this is part of the problem of our imagination. When invited to uh, comment on the sort of long term economic forecast, uh, John Maynard Keynes uh, reportedly said, well, in the long run, we're all dead. Uh, and Jesus invites his hearers to think about their current situation in the light of that. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Whereas by contrast, the disciples, blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Jesus points forward to a future in which the roles are completely reversed, in which those who follow him have permanent satisfaction and permanent delight. As Paul explained to us in our reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, at the heart of that is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. For, for the person who is attached to Jesus, resurrection is a certainty. There is a life that goes beyond the grave. There is permanence. So that there is a life to come in which the things that are yours are never lost to you, in which genuine satisfaction is a possibility, in which laughter is not a temporary situation. Uh, and this word, laughter, kind of carries the, the, the idea of triumph, celebration. It's not just sort of laughing at something that's funny, but it's you know, the idea of the one who laughs last laughs longest. And he says, the person whose satisfaction is based in things that are temporary, the person whose delight and whose laughter is based on things that are passing away, is utterly to be pitied. I don't know whether you, you think about it like this. I mean, I, I, it's a personality thing, partly. It's partly to do with life experience. But whenever I see someone triumph in a sporting contest... I always think this is the moment in their life that they will look back on and long for and it will recede gradually and become sadder and sadder for them. It'll become a symbol of what they used to be. I know that's a really, a bit of a Debbie Downer way to, to sort of look at sporting triumph, but it's what you see when someone enters number 10 Downing Street for the first time as Prime Minister, isn't it? There's an old saying that every political career ends in failure. No one wants to leave that residence willingly. 
Everyone will leave, either because their own party has rejected them or because the electorate has. Or because they're no longer up to the job. But that's the sort of pinnacle of your life. And there's something actually very melancholy about that, isn't there? I always think that when I see the sort of victory parties outside 10 Downing Street, one day this will be a sad memory, even though it's a great joy at the moment. And if we're absolutely honest with ourselves, that's the reality of life. If I satisfy myself, if I try to satisfy my soul, if I try to rest my well-being on something that is passing away, one day I will weep. One day I will be hungry. The things that I've yearned for cannot satisfy because they're passing and they're fading. But to those who follow him, Jesus says, because he is the one who can give life that lasts forever, because he is the one who can give everlasting joy, because he is the one who can give things that will never fade or perish or spoil. He says, best are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Your future, even if life is grim now, is a future of complete satisfaction and utter delight, of triumph of the laughter of the conqueror who will never be conquered. It's quite a thing, isn't it? Now, does the blessedness of the Christian life then, does the blessedness of following Jesus simply consist in the fact that we know that there is a, a future that is worth having? And is it all about pie in the sky when you die? And I want to answer that by saying yes and no. Does it just take you... Is it an escapist fantasy where you say, well, this world doesn't really matter. I'm just living for the next. Well, you know, sometimes there are Christians who've lived with such hardship that it has basically become that. You think about the extraordinary spirituals that enslaved African people wrote as they suffered under the whip in the heat of the Caribbean sun. They sang, this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. My treasures are laid up for me somewhere beyond the blue. And there is something in there that allows you to cope with the worst kind of hardship. The worst kind of treatment. But there is more to what Jesus says about the blessedness of the disciple than simply there is blessing to come. It's striking that in each of those four blessings, he says, you are blessed now. You are blessed who are poor, who are hungry who are weeping, who are rejected. There's a blessing now in this permanent state of affairs of being in right relationship with God, being in the kingdom. And in fact, only two of the incentives Jesus offers are in the future. You will be satisfied. You will laugh. The other two are in the present. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And then blessed are you who are rejected and spoken against. Because that's how their ancestors treated the prophets. So there's this picture of a transformed life in the present on the basis of the permanence that Jesus offers on the basis of being in a right relationship with him, the kingdom of God is yours now. 
you live in a vital and living relationship with the God who made you. At this moment, the kingdom has come to you. You have begun to live life as it is meant to be lived. You've received the supreme blessing of being part of God's kingdom. And even when you're rejected, it's, it's, it's almost as though in that moment you see the reality of God's approval of you. Now that idea can be taken and twisted and, uh, and turned into terrible things when people say, you know, if I behave really badly and people hate me, that's a sign that God loves me. It, it's very clear what Jesus says. Reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man, because of your allegiance to Jesus. Not because you're a horrible person. But nonetheless, when that rejection comes because of your following Jesus, he says it's almost as though you can look and you can see, well, that's how people of this world treated the prophets, the the people who came and spoke in God's name, who declared the kingdom that was to come. People didn't like it. It was too much. To be invited to loosen your grip on the things of this world is terrifying. If the things of this world are your only hope of comfort, your only hope of satisfaction, your only hope of joy. It's a terrifying thing. And the prophets came and they said, stop treating the world around you as if it was the thing you were made for. God is what you were made for. So look to him. Well, people didn't like to hear that and they rejected the prophets. And so says Jesus, when they reject you, it's almost a sign that you're people who have God's approval. And so even now and in the moment, there is a supreme blessing for those who follow Jesus. Because there is a relationship with God of approval. That human approval can never substitute for. We're all wired in different ways. There are different things that our hearts are sort of tuned into as, if I could just get that, everything will fall into place. Now, for some of us, that's our reputation, that's people's approval, that's, you know, people speaking well of us. That's where our hearts are tuned in on the dial. And if, and if we feel that people are in some way looking down on us or rejecting us or not approving us as we'd like, it feels like the world is wrong. It feels like everything's out of kilter. Well, for other us, it's security. And so wealth, you know, having enough put away in the pension fund, whatever it is, enough in bricks and mortar, that is the thing that, as long as that's in place, we feel like well, things will be okay. I've, I, I've got the comfort of knowing I'm secure. For other of us, it's, it, it's physical pleasure of one kind or another, described here in, by Jesus in terms of being full of food. We feel like as long as, as long as we can kind of enjoy ourselves, or as long as we can win, then everything will be fine. But none of those things can ever satisfy. As we've seen, they're just passing away. They're not God. They're not what you were made for. They'll fail you. And so the difference for the Christian, living in this world of fading glories, is that you're free to live in and enjoy this world for what it is. But you're not captured by it. 
There's an old saying, I don't know who came up with it first, that if, if there's something you own and you can't give it away, you don't own it. It owns you. That becomes quite a scary thing if you start thinking about it for too long, doesn't it? What are the things in my life that I couldn't give up? Is it my good name? Is it my possessions? Is it, you know, a lifestyle? Whatever it might be. But if you live in the kingdom, you're set free from being owned by the things that you own. From being captive to pleasure or to your good name. Because the thing is, if you try to rest all of your weight on those things, in the end, they become slave masters, don't they? You have to keep serving them. And you're trapped. I remember many years ago, I met a a man who used to fly uh, helicopters uh, for the army and um, for the SAS, uh, and who then uh, eventually became a missionary uh, flying helicopters around uh, and and fixed-wing aircraft around Papua New Guinea. But he described a kind of key moment in his career where um, he was working for the commanding officer of his uh, battalion, and uh, the phone rang, and it was his job to answer it. Uh, And... um, The commanding officer said to him, tell them I'm not here. And you can see the choice that's in front of uh, a man, his name was David Marfleet, uh, that stood in front of him in that moment. What was he going to do? He he knew his Ten Commandments. He was a Christian man. It's pretty clear that you're not supposed to lie. And yet, it's his commanding officer asking him to do it. Disobeying a direct order is, you could lose your career, you could lose everything. He'd worked so hard to get where he was. And now he had this this great opportunity working for the the most sort of powerful person in his bit of the organisation. And now, all he had to do was lie to keep that man on side. What do you do in that moment? Those are the things that face us every day, aren't they? Will we go God's way or our own? You know, but in that moment, you can see the goal, the God, if you like, of career, of success, of being well thought of, is there on one side of the equation saying, it's just a lie. And on the other, there is God who has clearly said, They didn't lie to each other. What was he to do? He's asked me to tell you that he's not here. (laughs) Well, you can imagine the CEO wasn't terribly impressed. But as has happened with others in that situation, what David was able to say to him is, well, of course, if I uh, can lie for you, I could lie to you. At least now you know you can trust me. And actually his career wasn't destroyed, but it could have been. And let's imagine it was. What would Jesus say to him? Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. The future so conditions the present as to make you free to live the life God has called you to live, which in the end is the best life possible. And so money and reputation and comfort won't control you. And in time, as you live like that, you'll enjoy the freedom of God's blessing But also, your life will need to be explained. Because it won't make sense to a world that is trapped by these pleasures. So blessed are you who are poor, 
for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil, because of the Son of Man. There is nothing that can happen to you if you follow the risen Christ. There is nothing that can happen to you in your life that can take away that precious status of blessed, of knowing God's pleasure, and of knowing that whatever temporary setback you might face, and it might be a huge one, or feel like a huge one, but whatever happens, your future is secure, you're accepted by the God who made the universe, delighted him by him, and nothing can be taken from you that was ultimately yours to keep. Whereas if you bet your life the other way, you will lose it all. And ironically, that is something that no one denies. You can't take your good name, you can't take your money, you can't take your pleasure with you. The grave will swallow it all up and it will be lost. But for the Christian, the grave is but a bed of rest until the resurrection. And not only will the things that really matter in your life now be yours forever, but treasures untold in the presence of God himself. So it's not easy what Jesus has to say to us. And for some, it's not even very palatable. But it is glorious. And what a thing it is to leave this building today knowing that no matter what happens, there is a blessing that is yours that can never be taken away. There's a confidence in that, isn't there? And there's a joy in that. That nothing that is yours that truly matters will be lost to you forever. What a comfort in dark times. And what a spur to faithfulness and love and kindness it is when things are going well. We don't have to grasp onto the things of this world because there is another much more glorious world yet to come.